Hello everyone, welcome to module four. We're moving right along in the course. In this module, we'll focus on ethics, specifically the ethics of providing legal information. Now, before we get started, I would encourage you to revisit Catherine McGuire's lecture from our module two area, uh, because Dr. McGuire talks about it so well. Uh, and so in this lecture, we're gonna take a broader context, and that is the unauthorized practice of law. So um, for an agenda today, we will cover the historical practice of law, the regulation of the practice of law, exceptions to UPL laws, and then finally some takeaways. Now <clears throat> to get started, let's review the historical practice of law. Originally, the highest state courts throughout the country claimed jurisdiction to regulate all aspects of the practice of law through such activities like specifying the conditions for admission, disciplining or disbarring lawyers who didn't exercise good conduct, uh, and promulgating codes of conduct, things of that nature. Uh, and although we can say that it is the courts that ultimately enforce the regulation of the practice of law, it's really the bar associations, which came on the scene in the late 19th century, that have largely set the agenda for the regulation of the practice of law. Um, for example, these associations are instrumental in lobbying for the passage of legislation that prohibited non-lawyers from making court appearances. And then in the 1920s, the bar associations attempted to grab greater control over the practice of law by spearheading efforts to integrate the bar through court rules, um, these being pursuant to the inherent powers and statutes that require every lawyer to belong to a state bar. And then by the 1930s, the American Bar Association had formed its own committee on the unauthorized practice of law. Uh, the canon of professional uh, ethics, ethics was one of those early iteration of the uh, legal profession's code of conduct. Uh, the ABA later amended that in 1937 to actually include a very strong attack, if you will, on the unauthorized practice of law. And the current version of the model um, has uh, rules of professional conduct, uh, that address the unauthorized practice of law. But to the extent that these model rules exist, they really only apply to lawyers. And obviously the rule is focused on what lawyers who are members of one state bar can do, for example, in other states. Uh, and that makes sense. Uh, but if you look at the comments uh, of the model rules, you really can get a sense of the rationale for the for the rules. And um, the rationale, at least, I think we can say applies to non-lawyers as well, even if the express language isn't uh, explicitly so. And so the ABA took a position that it was very much in the profession's best interest, as one would expect. Uh, and um, they did that, though, by not precisely defining the practice of law, leaving ambiguity there. Uh, and so throughout the uh, remaining of the 20th century, um, what progressed was a lot of vague statutes. Uh, and, you know, you might look at that and say, uh, well, that's kind of like circular logic or circular definition. And, you know, one could argue that uh, that vagueness or ambiguity is uh, is done on purpose, right? Um, sometimes um, you don't want to define things in concrete terms because that leaves, you no know, wiggle room. Now, you know, having said that, we can uh, establish that the practice of law is work that's traditionally done by lawyers, lawyers who have passed the bar. And so in determining what's constituted the practice of law, uh, then we can also kind of at the same time uh, deal with what is unauthorized practice of law, what's more commonly known as the unauthorized practice of law or UPL. But that was largely left to the courts 
and set by precedent, right? Or on a case by case basis. So then in terms of enforcement, um, these uh, new unauthorized practices that uh, came into being through uh, court rulings um, kind of became these uh, certain prohibitions. And the organized bar then often took the lead in bringing enforcement actions. Um, so again, what that led to is, uh, you know, the, the notion of self-interest and self-preservation uh, of the profession. Uh, and so many alleged violations uh, were settled then by agreements between, uh, you know, the legal bar and competing professional groups. Uh, that was done outside of judicial involvement, which means that uh, what uh, what is and what isn't unauthorized practice of law or UPL hasn't always been clearly defined or recorded. Uh, and so that is why then um, it's difficult to come up with, you know, any concrete set of guidelines or even a definition which can clearly and succinctly explain especially to those who are non-lawyers, what is and is not the practice of law. So let's move on then to uh, the regulation of the practice of law. And <clears throat> I guess the first question that we need to answer is why regulate the practice of law? And to answer that question then, let's take a step back and uh, Let's uh, talk a little bit about why the legal community is so keen, uh, perhaps even anxious, to regulate the practice of law. Now, um, although I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, there's this notion of uh, self-regulation or self-preservation, self-interest, uh, it's not just a matter of preservation, professional preservation. Um, for example, if anyone uh, can do what a lawyer does, why would you hire a lawyer, right? You go to them because they are professionals. Uh, and so um, preserving the law profession then, um, you know, is important because let's face it, you go through a lot to become a lawyer, right? Uh, you have to devote three years just to law school. You have to pass a uh, what can be a rigorous bar examination. So it takes a lot to get there. Uh, and so, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that, uh, you know, not anyone, just anyone can do what a lawyer does. Um, and, you know, those who defend uh, the uh, uh, authorized practice of law then will argue often using uh, the medical analogy. And that's basically this, right? So... You wouldn't want an unlicensed doctor, for example, to remove your appendix, right? You, you just you just don't go, uh, you know, uh, down the street and ask a neighbor to perform surgery on you, or you know, uh, get on uh, I don't know next door Facebook or whatever, and and find the first person person who says that they can uh, you know perform that kind of surgery. So the inference there is that you don't want an unqualified lawyer helping you in some uh, matter of uh, litigation or legal situation. But that's where it gets a little trickier, right? Uh, when we think about um, what legal matters constitute. And even just in our daily lives, uh, especially when uh, we talk about legal matters, it can be construed to be routine. Uh, it's less about the knowledge and practice of the law and perhaps more about the knowledge of procedure or processes involved in that particular matter of uh, law. And so um, that leads the critics of unauthorized practice of law to point out that uh, such justifications tend to rest on faulty or untested assumptions. Uh, and if we took that to an extreme to make a point, that being uh, that a lawyer is always going to be more competent uh, than a non-lawyer for a given task. Or maybe we use the assumption that in a free market, consumers will always choose uh, incompetent uh, non-lawyers over competent lawyers uh, because of economic uh, matters, right? Uh, or maybe because uh, 
what fees are charged are more affordable. So maybe those are two extremes that help us kind of frame the argument a little better. Uh, another example is that some have argued that consumers of legal services tend to look towards indicators of reliability uh, over licensing necessarily when determining competence of a legal provider uh, and that, uh, you know, the broad consumer protection statutes are often more effective at protecting consumers from incompetent and fraudulent practices or providers than, uh, you know, the so-called canon of unauthorized practices of law or UPL statutes even. Uh, and so <clears throat> that leads us then to uh, uh, let's establish what unauthorized practice of law is. Uh, and once we get into that, um, uh, we understand that uh, there is empirical evidence demonstrating that non-lawyers can be just as effective uh, at practicing law as non-lawyers. Uh, and so, again, that's kind of where, uh, you know, it gets a little tricky, right? Uh, and so then what rises out of that is a question of, is it really in the public's best interest to sustain what could be construed as a monopoly-like condition for the legal profession, particularly given the ongoing concerns about the ability of the legal profession to meet the legal needs of low-income individuals. Uh, and then this also then gets right to the heart of uh, what we call the access to justice issue. Uh, and so as we move into unauthorized practice of law, what we see is uh, people beginning to embrace the idea that maybe we need to loosen the UPL rules so that we can begin to close the justice gap, right? So uh, this justice gap exists because of the demand for legal services uh, in some sectors uh, greatly exceeds the supply of available legal services and lawyers. So if we revisit the appendix analogy, we can definitely see that there are some differences in how we defined UPL uh, or the rather the unauthorized practice, excuse me, of medicine versus UPL. So while it's true that an unlicensed person is not supposed to perform surgery or prescribe medicine, the American Medical Association, the AMA, doesn't have the power to fine um, you know, a massage therapist who advises the client to take some herbal uh, remedy instead of an antidepressant. And, and so, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a big contrast then between uh, what we see in the medical field versus what we see uh, the kind of power exercised by bar associations. Uh, but if we tend to think of it, um, when it comes to the law, the bar associations of many states are not just empowered to identify people who are violating uh, the UPL rules, but they can also take them to court. Uh, now, there are some differences, you know, in how that is applied, how it gets coupled with the justice issues and so forth. But essentially what it comes down to is we're not effectively meeting the needs of a certain part of the population. Uh, and so then we have to kind of seriously entertain the idea of do we do we really need to regulate the practice of law or at least do we need to regulate it to the extent that we have before uh, if that answer is yes so as i said earlier uh, all states restrict the practice of law to licensed attorneys uh, but the statutes imposing these restrictions aren't actually always written with the clearest of language now, most states will tend to define the practice of law broadly. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, or vaguely. And it's really hard for non-lawyers to figure out what they actually can or can't do in some instances. For one example, uh, take the instance of the state of Georgia, in which its code defines the practice of law as any action taken for others in any matter concerned with the law. Contrast that with Illinois, a state in which the giving advice or rendition of any sort of service by a person, firm, or corporation when giving of such advice 
or rendition of such service requires the use of any degree of legal or knowledge skill. Uh, so you can kind of see that um, that's pretty broad. So uh, one thing we have to think about then is um, what the three uh, categories uh, are then that generally are um, considered to constitute the unauthorized practice of law. Now those are on the on the slide. Uh, you can look those over, uh, but it basically comes down to those three things. And uh, we can say then that representing another in a judicial or administrative proceeding, uh, preparing legal instruments or documents affecting the legal rights of another, uh, or advising another of their legal rights and responsibilities, those are the three categories. Uh, but then we also have to add to it that statutes um, name specific individuals and organizations which are not permitted to practice law. Um, for example, uh, title insurance companies and uh, non-legal corporations. Uh, so with that then, um, there are definitely exceptions to the UPL statutes. Uh, generally, these exceptions are limited to self-representation, sometimes include layperson representation um, before certain courts and state administrative agencies. Uh, and that brings us to Maryland. How does Maryland view um, the unauthorized practice of law? Well, I've put the uh, applicable code uh, on, the, on the slide before you there. Um, and like Maryland, many other states uh, list several broad categories of activities included in the practice of law. Uh, and those can include things like preparing or helping in the preparation of a former document uh, filed uh, in a court of law. Uh, or that affects a case or that is uh, may be filed in a court and giving advice about a case that is or may be filed in a court. Uh, now, issues that do come up in connection. Uh, let's take the example of law schools in Maryland. Uh, now, there are two law schools in Baltimore. Both of them have really strong uh, legal clinical programs that provide uh, valuable services to Baltimore City residents who lack the means to hire a private attorney. These programs, though, uh, do sometimes uh, cross the line with the state's unauthorized practice of law statutes. For example, um, a few years ago, there was a project that was proposed by the University of Baltimore School of Law, uh, and their plan was to work in conjunction with a legal services provider, uh, and they plan to provide free assistance to Baltimore residents who had been turned away from uh, a provider. Um, generally in situations where there was some kind of uh, deemed to be a low stakes legal issue uh, or because uh, resource issues that these legal service providers uh, you know were forced to make decisions about the cases they could take and, and the cases that they they couldn't take on. Um, so the plan went something along the lines of um, residents who would receive uh, full disclosure of the school's limited ability to assist them. A student's scope of work would be very limited. Uh, the law students uh, were to come up with a proposal uh, uh, and they, uh, they had to look at advisory opinions that had been previously issued by the Maryland AG, the Attorney General. But still, there was a concern that there were um, uh, too close to those uh, boundaries of unauthorized practice of law in the statute. Uh, and so the AG's office finally did uh, weigh in on the issue. Uh, and uh, they basically stated that there really uh, wasn't any statutory authority for the project. Uh, and they felt that uh, basically the majority of the things that the students wanted to do uh, were uh, a violation of the uh, UPL rules. 
Uh, and so we had this situation then that what started with, uh, you know, uh, 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 an initiative that was really kind of designed to address the justice gap and, um, you know, help uh, those who uh, had um, legal access issues um, just unfortunately was not allowed to proceed. Uh, and you can see then that, uh, you know, the willingness of, uh, you know, either one of these law schools to kind of, uh, I guess, go into that territory again, um, you know, there's just a reluctance uh, based upon that. Uh, and so we see that low income individuals are not uh, likely to receive that kind of um, uh, service in the future. Uh, primarily based upon, uh, you know, this one uh, situation with the uh, University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, and so what that then leads us to uh, is the importance of promoting the use of self-help resources. So um, in Florida, uh, there's a family court rule that uh, very clearly describes the type of information that uh, self-help um, desk personnel uh, in the legal area can provide. Now, uh, the information about legal services, the authorized forms that are available, information about the docket, um, so on and so forth, uh, once cases have been filed. But the Florida uh, rules do not allow them to provide legal advice. Now, put another way, um, you can provide legal recommendations about specific courses of action, but you cannot provide interpretations of legal terminology. So if you work in Florida, you have good, clear guidance, but, um, you know, this type of clarity, as we've seen, isn't everywhere. So in result, then, uh, libraries and nonprofit organizations that want to help individuals meet their legal information needs uh, may have a lot of questions about what they can and can't do. Now, as we've talked about, more libraries have moved into this area, and so we've seen AALL and other professional organizations, state law libraries, other self-help legal desks and such, publish guidance in this area. And if you think uh, about it, the materials that I've provided earlier in the course, um, there are uh, some of those things that you can uh, go back and refer to. Uh, now, uh, just to kind of bring it uh, home again, um, no pun intended, uh, we're fortunate to live in the state of Maryland uh, where there is vibrant access to uh, a justice community, and we have a judiciary that has been very supportive of self-represented litigants. Uh, and then uh, with that, we'll move on then to exceptions to UPL laws. Pardon me for one second. All right, so on one of the previous slides, uh, I gave the uh, three broad categories of activity that are considered to be unauthorized practice of law or UPL. Uh, and then I guess less well-defined uh, are our exceptions. So um, I've listed several of those on this slide. Uh, and so, <clears throat> There's a fair amount of controversy uh, about these, uh, particularly in the case of uh, Scriveners. Uh, and a colleague that worked in the bankruptcy court um, dealt with um, this uh, issue firsthand. And, uh, you know, there's definitely some unscrupulous people out there that will take advantage of people in need. Um, but, you know, the legitimate document preparers are fine and they do wonderful work. Uh, now, uh, about non-lawyer representation in administrative proceedings, uh, sorry, proceedings, uh, administrative law is a whole different piece. Uh, you know, it's got different rules, different regulations, even different proceedings. Uh, and the non-lawyer participation and exercise of federal uh, constitutional rights is yet another area uh, that, um, you know, deserves its own treatment. Uh, and so, um, 
you know, uh, maybe a really good example of uh, this might be legal zoom, right? Uh, and so let's move on uh, then to, um, you know, uh, other non-lawyer assistance issues. Um, before I do that, I, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, with uh, legal zoom, let me go back here real quick uh, because I, I did have another point that I wanted to bring up there. Um, and that is that, um, you know, legal zoom, um, you know, in their disclaimer, uh, if we look at that a little more closely, uh, referring to the slide, um, you know, they, they have this disclaimer uh, that very clearly says that they're not, excuse me, not permitted to engage in the practice of law. You, you'll see that in that kind of that third paragraph. Um, they really can't provide any kind of advice, explanation, opinion, uh, or recommendation to a consumer about possible legal rights uh, if you read on remedies, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and that's that's telling, right? So they're there to uh, assist you. Uh, they're not there to represent you. Uh, all right, so apologize for that, but I didn't want to uh, make sure that uh, we visited that sufficiently. Uh, so again, um, think uh, back on Kathleen McGuire's lecture where she really hammered home the difference between advice and information. Sometimes it can be clear cut, sometimes it isn't. Uh, and it can be hard when somebody uh, wants advice coupled with our own human nature to want to help people, right? Uh, we want to give them what it is that they want. And, you know, when you think about uh, that desire, that basic human nature to want to do those things, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, that's the very thing that makes social engineering so effective. Uh, people want to help other people. Uh, and so when somebody asks for your help, if it seems legitimate uh, and, you know, they make a case, uh, you know, it's our own human nature to feel empathetic for them and want to help. Um, uh, and that just gets to the nature of how, when we're dealing in real time with a uh, patron, that interaction can be uh, a little bit messy, right? All right, so uh, non-lawyer uh, assistance. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. And uh, we are close to uh, wrapping up. Uh, so forms or strategies, uh, what can we do, right? There's really two important questions that we need to deal with here. Uh, you know, the notion of basic legal knowledge and access. Uh, is there a role, uh, especially with lower stakes legal problems? Uh, and is lawyer, non-lawyer assistance cost effective and appropriate as some kind of partial solution? Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit then about, um, you know, what, what kinds of strategies can you utilize there? Uh, and uh, really, um, we can um, basically, you know, tell them the forms that they might want to use. Uh, we can point them to resources, things like that. But we we can't really tell them which one to use, right? That maybe is uh, where we cross the line. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, in this kind of a setting, we can say, yeah, I know the difference between those two things. Uh, but when you're in the uh, heat of the moment, if you will, or in that situation, it uh, gets a little fuzzier, right? Uh, and when somebody is confronting you, you well, I, d I don't really know which form it is. Can you just tell me? I, I'm so confused by this stuff. Um, you know, that's where it gets, uh, as I said, a little messier. Uh, and, uh, you know, even after the fact, you might uh, tend to think about some of these things. Uh, and you would think to yourself, uh, well, 
you know, in, in retrospect, maybe that wasn't the right move that I might said. You might even tend to think that you uh, maybe said too much in a particular situation. Uh, and so uh, thinking back then to that legal Zoom di disclaimer on the last slide, uh, those kinds of things are good to have. It's good to have some kind of uh, standard operating uh, procedure or a policy, things that make it uh, very clearly, uh, you know, where our lanes are and, uh, you know, kind of serve as guardrails to keep us from uh, going off the road uh, on what we can and cannot do. Uh, and so, oops, sorry about that. Um, and so um, with these um, fairly um, well-defined exceptions and such, there's at least some consensus uh, for the role that non-lawyers can play when it comes to helping people address their legal needs. Uh, but we're far from uh, uh, defining, uh, definitively defining what this uh, really looks like, right? And depending upon where you are, that may look differently. Now, um, where the practice of uh, law is governed at the state level, we see a lot of variation in terms of uh, uh, what those definitions are uh, and um, what's been done to formalize the practices, right? Uh, and so, uh, for example, um, the state of Washington uh, really has been uh, the vanguard on uh, reforming uh, uh, the on, uh, you know, the UPL rules uh, over the last decade, uh, especially to provide a framework uh, that was designed to allow for the use of non-lawyer assistance in certain cases. Um, and um, along with recognizing their role there, um, you know, we can also state that they were, uh, uh, it was very important to them that they addressed the justice gap that I spoke to earlier, and they took some kind of action to close that gap. Um, for example, the Washington State Supreme Court had adapted a rule that provided for the licensing of what they called limited license legal technicians. Uh, that definitely was a positive step uh, in providing legal assistance to underrepresented uh, litigants. Uh, and they drew a line that uh, these legal technicians could not represent clients in court. So um, that rule was opposed by the state bar, uh, but it did go into effect, uh, I think, around 2012. Uh, and it's important to note that that rule made it permissible for legal technicians uh, to perform that role, but that didn't provide a lot in terms of assisting people with litigation needs, right? It just kind of opened a doorway. Uh, and that's how um, this concept uh, or this notion of legal technicians came about. Uh, uh, and then in 2013, they decided to uh, kind of extend that into the family law uh, as a first practice area, uh, and they took non-lawyer applicants um, who could apply for licenses uh, not long after that period of time. Uh, and then, so why did do you think they start with the family law? Uh, it basically came down to the fact that in Washington State, uh, that's where the need was greatest, and uh, you know, something like eighty percent of family law cases, uh, they determined the one or both of the parties uh, were unrepresented. Uh, and so they blazed that trail. Uh, and we could also then talk about New York State. They've taken some important steps to allow non-lawyers to address um, the justice gap. Uh, and Judge Jonathan Lippman spearheaded a task force um, that eventually led to a pilot program focusing on non-lawyer assistance and housing foreclosures and consumer credit areas. Uh, now the area of foreclosures, right? That makes a lot of sense just because, excuse me, um, normally the reason that um, a foreclosure is occurring is because of some, some kind of financial issue, right? So if you're uh, in financial straits, um, chances are you don't have money to hire an attorney. 
And so there's this, uh, you know, really easy to see uh, need uh, around that area of uh, foreclosures uh, that we could extend to consumer credit areas too. So what we've seen then is two areas in uh, which different models were employed uh, to provide uh, non-lawyer assistance. Uh, and then around the 2014, 2015 timeframe, um, you know, there were uh, multiple pro bono initiatives that uh, kind of sprouted up. Uh, and those all involved um, some uh, format of training and then supervising uh, non-lawyers uh, to provide pro bono assistance in housing and debt collection cases. Uh, and then even it's setting up uh, general information help desks. Uh, so these efforts then uh, led uh, to uh, uh, even cases uh, where one-to-one -one assistance uh, was extended outside of the courtroom. Uh, and a program uh, was involving the use of non-lawyer navigators and these navigators were considered to be people who would actually be allowed to accompany self-represented litigants into, into the housing court. Uh, and so they were not lawyers. They very clearly were, uh, you know, referred to uh, as a different term, navigator. And that navigator's role was intended to help litigants um, to really have a better idea of what to expect in the courtroom um, and to provide support and assistance throughout the proceeding. Uh, and the distinction, I think the key distinction in this navigator role then was um, that they were not allowed to address the court. Uh, the judge uh, could call on the navigator to answer some factual question. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's some nuances there, but um, guess what? This also was in Washington State and in New York State. So um, important and some really interesting movement um, in trying to figure out this gray space between just providing information, uh, whether in a self-help center uh, or an information desk, and pushing uh, into more uh, personalized and more specific assistance uh, while still attempting not to run afoul of the unauthorized practice of law statutes. Um, and so we learned about two different models to develop uh, to close uh, the justice gap. Uh, these are not only models out there, and this provides hope that over time, we can gain some ground in recognizing the properly trained lawyers uh, may be given uh, a more defined role in helping people um, uh, in the legal system. Now, to be sure, um, this is something that's going to occur quickly, right? Um, I mean, let's face it, we have to overcome a century or more of legal inertia, I'll call it, uh, and that means progress is slow. Uh, and uh, there are powerful entities such as the bars in many states uh, and this notion of self-interest or professional preservation uh, is also strong among the legal profession. Uh, and then still there are other states out there who have taken the wait and see approach, right? Uh, so they, they see the trailblazers like Washington State, New York State, uh, and, you know, they um, decide, well, let's just see how this turns out before we commit to any actions ourselves. Uh, and so there's not really a cookie cutter approach uh, that can be taken. Uh, but that said, we do know that the justice gap is a real issue. Uh, and so then each state must kind of grapple with this uh, on their own. Uh, and they have to figure out what works best with their unique state culture and political environment and the needs of their population, right? Uh, but still, there is reason for optimism uh, in addressing the justice gap. Uh, and that leads us then to uh, our takeaways. So um, there are several that I've uh, enumerated here on the slide. 
but in the information sciences arena, uh, how this unfolds, how this will unfold over time, then presents both not just an exciting area of expansion, but it's a little bit scary uh, when we realize the impact that um, we could have on people's lives and the collective community good that's involved in doing so. So as you contemplate public service, or, or if you're already in that public service role, I encourage you to think about that role that should be played by your specific organization uh, or geographic setting based upon the state where you live uh, and your community and the needs of uh, your patrons or patrons that you think you will have as you move into this area. All right. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll put my contact info up for uh, a moment. So uh, you'll have this in the slide deck that I post into our uh, Blackboard classroom. Uh, and with that, please let me know if you have any questions. And until next time, uh, do enjoy the module uh, and other activities ahead of you. And thank you very much. <music>